As you've heard on Bridge City News, the non-confidence vote did not pass in Ottawa, but the fight over the carbon tax continues. Now to chat about this in more detail is political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev continues to draw very large crowds with his Axe the Tax rallies. But Environment Minister Stephen Guibault, in a recent interview, did not rule out even more carbon tax hikes that are currently planned. It was remarkable to watch. Here he is. Uh, he knows everything that's been going on. He can read a poll just like anybody else. And he was asked, well, you know, once the carbon tax gets to $170 a ton, remember, it's at 65 right now. It, they're going to triple it to $170 a ton, or just about triple it to $170 a ton by 2030. And he said, well, the interviewer said, well, what about uh, beyond that? And he said, well, we haven't made a decision yet, but we will keep it increasing the price of pollution. So the carbon tax is going to keep going up past $170. Remember when it was much lower and the Liberals went into the, the 2019 election saying, oh, we, you know, we, we haven't decided that we're going to increase it. And then immediately after, they jacked it up to $170 a ton. Um, you know, we could be looking at that again with this price just continually climbing, driving up the cost of everything. Now, while the Trudeau Liberals insist that the carbon tax leaves 80% of families better off financially, Brian, the parliamentary budget officer says the majority of families are actually worse off. So let me ask you, who is telling the truth here? Uh, the parliamentary budget officer is, and I'll give you a, a proof point. Statistics Canada, in their January um, Consumer Price Index report, that's the inflation report, they noted that inflation was lower in Saskatchewan because as of January 1st, Scott Moe had ordered their crown corporation, Sask Energy, not to collect the carbon tax on home heating. So you take the carbon tax off home heating, inflation falls. Doesn't that show you that the price is going up? Um, Yves Giroux, the parliamentary budget officer, was before a Commons committee last week repeating his message that once you factor in all the issues, most families pay more than they get back. We discussed last week, Hal, how the rebates are all based on averages. And you, know, you living out in Lethbridge drive a lot more than I do living in downtown Toronto, but they just average it all out. And my condo is a lot cheaper to heat than your home, but they just average it out. And so you're paying, most Canadians who live, your average suburban lifestyle are gonna be paying more, and then they get back. And then the parliamentary budget officer says you, you factor in lost productivity, lower economic activity, the GST on top, that drives it up. The Liberals don't want to admit it. They, they, you know, they don't want to acknowledge that this has driven up prices of absolutely everything. You know, when the majority of MPs voted against the non-confidence motion, well, I mean MPs with the Liberals, the Bloc and the NDP, you wrote that they were voting against the mood of the nation. Now, you also say that this government will not be defeated due to the pension coalition that will soon govern Ottawa. Can you explain? So voting against the mood of the nation is easy. 69% of Canadians said they don't want the carbon tax increase. That cuts across all party lines at that point. You've only got the true believers saying, oh, no, please increase my taxes more. The majority of Canadians are saying this is hurting. You've got premiers across the country saying, please stop including Wab Canoe, New Democrat in Manitoba, uh, Andrew Fury, a liberal in Newfoundland and Labrador. You've got, you've got NDP candidates or uh, candidates for the leadership of the Alberta NDP saying, elect me and I'll fight to scrap the carbon tax. So uh, this is not a popular policy. And yet the Trudeau Liberals keep pushing ahead on it. And when 64% of uh, MPs vote for something that 69% of the public doesn't want, they're going against the mood of the nation. But these changes to the Elections Act will mean that, in my view, we will definitely not see an election before October 2025. And that small change is they're going to move the date for the fixed election from October 20th to October 27th. Now, the, the line from the government is they're doing this for two reasons. The Hindu festival of Diwali starts around October 20th, we're on October 20th, and Alberta is scheduled to have municipal elections then. So they want to move the date not forward, they want to move it back by one week to October 27th, 2025. And the reason for that is that on October 21st, 2025, 
80 different MPs will qualify for their pension. Now, if you're a liberal or a new Democrat, and to some degree a Bloc Québécois MP, you have to be worried if an election were held now, you'd lose your seat and not get your pension. You move it back by a week, they're guaranteed their pension. So even if they lose, according to the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, depending on uh, what their salary was, based on if they ran committees, had you know parliamentary secretary positions, what have you, their, their pension would start at the age of 55 at between thirty-two and $49,000 a year. And the total hit to the Canadian taxpayers, if all of these guys lost their, their, their jobs and took their pensions, it'd be about $120 million. Moving the election one day doesn't change anything in your life or my life. How? Okay, well, one, one week. But to these guys, this matters a lot. And can you imagine any MP in the Liberal, Bloc, or N, uh, NDP voting for a non-confidence motion if one comes up again? The Conservatives would probably be like, yeah, we'll win our seat back. The rest of them? No. This guarantees them that they will not vote for anything but keeping Trudeau in power until that time. When we chatted with Franco Terrazano, the federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, he called that very shady. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister of Greece was in Canada this week asking that we supply his country and Europe with liquefied natural gas, LNG, Brian. Now, is there any chance the Trudeau government will actually seize this opportunity? No, none at all. And you'll recall that uh, Germany came in August of 2022 saying, we want to buy your natural gas. We want to replace Russian natural gas, the, the natural gas that's funding the war in Ukraine. Trudeau said, well, you know, we, there's never been a business case for this. Japan showed up. They wanted to buy our liquefied natural gas. They were told the same thing. No, we're not really interested. We're about to open one port uh, on the West Coast that was approved under the Harper government. It's taken longer to build than it should have, but it's finally about to open. That will be our only LNG export plant. Meanwhile, the United States has built eight, I believe, over the last couple of years. Qatar has ramped up their production and their export capacity. Germany built an import facility in 194 days. The Greek prime minister came here and he said, look, we want to buy it, not only for our market, but to supply the Balkans, to supply Ukraine. This would remove coal-fired electricity plants from the grid in other parts of the world. And that would lower global emissions. If, if they're truly all about lowering global emissions and they say emissions, no, no, uh, the emissions don't know boundaries, well, then they should be on this. But they're not. And they're not because it would mean helping the oil and gas sector in Alberta. It would mean Canada's emissions would go up a bit. But you know what? Uh, there was a study by the National Bank that Pierre Polyev cited at the Vancouver Board of Trade speech he gave, where they pointed out that if we uh, replaced enough coal-fired plants just in India, it would be the equivalent of removing four years' worth of Canada's emissions in a single year. That's remarkable. That's the type of thing that we should be saying, yes, let's do it, but they won't do it because they've got an ideological opposition to the oil and gas industry. Brian, a number of Canadians want to know where this government stands when it comes to Gaza. Do we support Israel? Is there more support for the people of Gaza and those politicians who want to see an independent Palestinian nation? So where is Canada's policy on the Middle East right now? It's confusing. Um, you know, we've got a de facto arms embargo, though the government, you know, uh, different government officials will say, no, we don't. And yet Melanie Jolie says, yes, we do. They voted for one in the motion. That would show that they are against Israel. Now, I, I don't know anybody that, you know, wants to go against the, the Gazan people, but definitely against Hamas. I worry that the government is moving towards a, a position that puts them close to supporting Hamas. You know, we're demanding a, a, a ceasefire yet again. Well, Hamas just uh, refused a ceasefire deal that was negotiated by Egypt, Qatar, and the United States. So their own allies are helping negotiate the, the uh, ceasefire agreement, and Hamas is saying no. Um, time and again, they just want to keep this war going, and this war is going because of Hamas. But all of Canada's energy is put upon Israel. All of the pressure is put upon Israel. All of the shame put upon Israel. We, we are blaming Israel for being attacked and then defending itself. 
Now, we're approaching the four-year anniversary of the May 1st, 2020 government decree to ban 1,500 types of guns in Canada and begin a gun buyback. Brian, a new report shows the government spent about $42 million on this project but has not taken possession of a single gun. So what are they spending the money on? Uh, partly on IBM uh, and con outside consultants. It's not quite as bad as a Rivecan yet, but it's getting there. You've got the salaries. You've got 60 people working on this full-time at Public Safety Canada. You've got two working full-time at Service Canada. Um, you, you've got, uh, uh, I believe, let, let me try and remember the number, 5.825 full-time equivalents at Public Services and Procurement Canada. I mean, that, that that takes you back to your Ottawa days, Hal, right? The ultimate in government speak, and about 15 Mounties. So you've got just over 80 people working on this full time. You've got the photo ops, you've got the announcements, but you don't have any guns. Can you imagine what that $42 million could have done at border crossings where gun smuggling is a real issue? on trying to intercept the guns that are the real problem, that would have been far more beneficial than spending $42 million to build a system to take guns from licensed, law-abiding hunters and sport shooters. A judge in Calgary, Brian, has ruled that a 27-year-old woman with autism can move forward with medical assistance in dying despite the objections by her parents. Now, when MAID was first introduced, did anyone really expect we'd be offering government-assisted suicide to people with autism? You know, I, I, I remember speaking to opponents who warned of a slippery slope, and I doubt even they thought that it would turn into um, a giant water slide that we're all just hurtling down at, at breakneck speed. Uh, we are beyond a slippery slope here, Hal. Uh, and the judge ruling in it said that her autonomy trumps everything. Well, when did we decide that you, your autonomy includes getting the government's help in killing yourself. She has autism and ADHD, we're told. Um, don't know many of details of, of how difficult life is, but that's the type of person that you help, that you support. Not that you say, well, come on over here. We've got another solution. You can end your life. And, and I'm very concerned about where we're going. Polls show most Canadians are very concerned. Parliamentarians, I think, heard the message and put the brakes on this uh, when they were going to expand it even further. But I, I'm not sure how we go back and, and put this genie back in the bottle. It's uh, it's frightening the direction that we're going. Now, the the uh, the judge in this case in Calgary has done a 30 day uh, suspension of the verdict to see if either side wants to appeal. But if they don't appeal, then in 30 days, this, this woman can end her life um, if, for something that people deal with and live with every day uh, of the year in this country. It, it's got to be heartbreaking and worrisome for an awful lot of families who have a loved one with similar conditions. Brian, the state funeral for Brian Mulroney was held recently in Montreal. You wrote about the eulogies he received from Caroline Mulroney, Wayne Gretzky, and Jean Charest. Some made us laugh, and some of the stories even made us cry. If you had a dry eye after Carolyn Mulroney's uh, eulogy for her father or her daughter singing um, her grandfather's favorite song uh, while choking back tears, I'm not sure you're human. Uh, it's an emotional moment for, for anyone who's lost a loved one. You can definitely relate to a family going through pain. Uh, Wayne Gretzky, though, made everybody laugh. He got up there, the great one, uh, described how he first got to know the Mulroney's still playing in Edmonton with the Oilers, got asked to do a charity hockey game. They became fast friends and remained friends after. And, and he got up, and, and I think he was third or fourth in speaking order. There were six eulogies. And he got up and he said, well, you're going to figure out which one's in politics and which one's the hockey player real quick. And he spoke without notes, told his funny stories real quick, and left. But he left everyone feeling better. And then, you know, there's a lot of political speeches, including Jean Charest talking about how in 84 and 88, Mulroney really brought together Albertans and Quebecers and united the country in, in common cause. Absolutely, that fell apart by 93. But, you know, he was describing the way that, uh, that he was able to pull on different threads of Canada and, and bring us together. So it, it, it was a moving and a fitting tribute to a prime minister who was transformational in more ways than one. 
You know what, dude? It also fell apart in 86 and 89 when the Flames and the Habs met in the Stanley Cup Finals. Montreal winning in 86 and Calgary winning in 89 in Montreal, I might add, with Lanny McDonald. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal.